While all of this was going on, while creation science was getting hammered in the courts, we were, we at NCSE and probably many of you too, were getting much more interested in the new creationist kid on the block, which was something called intelligent design. Now, intelligent design actually got started about a decade earlier than most people noticed it. We did, because we're fanatics, of course, at NCSC. But intelligent design actually got started in the early 1980s, at about the time that McLean versus Arkansas was going on, and it was really clear that creation science wasn't making the grade. It wasn't going to work legally. So how do you come up with an anti-evolutionism that um, um, works when creation science is failing? And a man named John Buell at a Dallas ministry called the Foundation for Thought and Ethics got together with a bunch of other conservative Christians to try to well, I'm sorry, evolve a form of creationism that would be more effective than the floundering creation science. Now, they published two books. The first book was The Mystery of Life's Origin, which had to do with the origin of life. And in this book, the three authors, who were scientists and engineers, proclaimed that the origin of life is a really tough scientific problem, but it was more than that. It was an unsolvable problem. It was not only unexplained, it was unexplainable. That the origin of life was a special class of phenomena that was unassailable, unexplainable through natural causes. The only way, they said, you could explain that the origin of that first replicating cell was through intelligent agency there had to be a designer of that first cell. This, of course, is extremely reminiscent to William Paley's argument from design. Remember Paley, he's the uh, watch guy? If you see a watch, you know because of all the ways the pieces of a watch fit together to tell time, you know there had to be a watchmaker because there's no way that all the springs and wires and stuff in a watch could just spontaneously come together to tell time. There had to be a watchmaker. So, said Paley, when you see something complex in nature, like the vertebrate eye, there's no way that all of these pieces could have just come together accidentally uh, without design, without an eye maker, as it were. Uh, so, when you see something complex in nature, like the vertebrate eye, that tells you there's a god. Uh, William Paley's um, argument from design in his book Natural Theology was an argument for the existence of God. It was a, it was a, um, not a book intended to explain science necessarily. It was a, uh, it was an apologetic. This is basically what intelligent design is. It is a restatement of Paleyan. Um, uh, natural theology. It's the complexity argument requiring the intelligent agency, shall we say, and the agent spells his name with three letters and I'll spot you the first. It's G. Okay. <laughs> I like to let the proponents define the field. So I will let William Dembski, who is one of the main proponents of intelligent design, tell you what intelligent design is. In Bill Dembski's book, um, Intelligent Design, The Bridge Between Science and Theology, he says ID is three things. It is a scientific research program that investigates the causes, the effects of intelligent causes. He says that it is, number two, an intellectual movement that challenges Darwinism and its naturalist legacy, and three, a way of understanding divine action. Well, you know, Challenging Darwinism and its naturalistic legacy isn't a scientific endeavor, so that's not what we're going to talk about. Understanding divine action is kind of interesting, but it's not a scientific ac activity either, so we're going to talk about the claim that intelligent design is a scientific research program investigating the effects of intelligent causes. So what is the science of intelligent design? Well, folks, keep your expectations low because the science is pretty thin. It consists of two ideas. One idea is presented by Michael Behe in his book Darwin's Black Box, and this is the concept of irreducible complexity. A related idea is presented by William Dembski in his book The Design Inference, and this is uh, the design inference, or sometimes called complex specified information. Both of these are really talking about the same thing. Both of these 
uh, let's talk about irreducible complexity in a little bit more detail. But the design inference is quite similar. It's just a probability um, uh, recasting of the same general idea. Irreducible complexity is a claim that there are, as Bailey said, some things in nature that are really, really, really complex that cannot be explained through natural cause. But it goes a bit beyond Paley by saying that you can tell those particular structures because they have the quality that all of the parts of the structure have to be together at the same time before the structure will work. It is irreducibly complex. In Michael Behe's terms, it is a purposeful arrangement of parts like a human machine that uh, an, a, a carburetor or some other machine that we might make. Uh, all the parts of a carburetor have to be together before it will work. If you take away one part, your car won't run. I assume. I know nothing about cars. And I, somebody told me, what do you mean carburetors? Cars don't have carburetors anymore. What do I know about carburetors? <laughs> a mouse trap. That would be his favorite example. At any rate. Um, so he says, if you look at something like the bacteria flagellum, the little wiggly thing on the back of a bacterium that propels it, the motor of the bacteria flagellum is composed of about 40, 50 proteins. All of those proteins have to be together, or the bacterium just sort of lies there in the fluid. It doesn't go anywhere. The motor doesn't work. The bacteria flagellum motor is irreducibly complex. Therefore, it can't be built by natural selection. Natural selection, says B, he requires that each of those uh, 40 proteins of the bacteria flagellum have to be brought together one at a time like beads on a string, and there has to be a selective value for each of those combinations. So for the first two proteins, there has to be a value for this. And of course, there is none because there's no selective value until you get all the proteins together at the end. And then the third one gets brought in, but there's no selective value for that either. So it's this highly improbable uh, kind of uh, com combinatorial project that um, simply cannot work through natural selection. Therefore, when you see something that is this purposeful arrangement of parts, like the bacteria flagellum, this is evidence that an intelligent agent, wink, wink, nudge, nudge, guess who? put this together. It cannot evolve, categorically cannot evolve through natural selection. Now there's a lot, of, a lot of my talks, I go into this in detail. The nice thing about speaking to an audience like this is I don't have to convince you that this is junk. You may not know why it's, not, why it's junk, which is fine because you know, you're not all scientists, only a few of you are scientists. But you don't have to take my word for it. There's plenty of literature uh, here uh, available in the um, uh, scientific uh, literature, articles and books, um, where complex structures at the biochemical level, molecular level, cellular level, including even the beloved flagellum, uh, have been examined by scientists in very plausible natural selective and other natural ways of um, building these uh, complex structures um, have been postulated and, and they work pretty well. Well, as many of you know, the idea of, uh, dis uh, of intelligent design became quite popular during the 90s and the early, it's still pretty popular actually, early part of the uh, 2000s, and a school district in Dover, Pennsylvania passed a policy requiring that intelligent design be taught in the public schools there. A group of citizens sued the school district because they didn't want this religious view presented as science. This became quite a cause celeb. Uh, in fact, it even appeared on The Daily Show, which goes to show what a cultural phenomenon this was. Um, and um, not to spoil the uh, punchline for you, but you all know that the judge ruled against the Dover policy and to our delight, ruled that intelligent design, in fact, was not science. It was merely a religious view and was unconstitutional to advocate. Not to put too fine a point on it, the judge also awarded $2 million in costs to the plaintiffs, which was a bit of a warning, shall we say, to other school districts that this is not a good place to go. 